This episode of the Disruptors in the Culture podcast, brought to you by Mike J Media, is supported by Black Music City, Rec Philly, WXPN, and WRTI. Welcome to another episode of Disruptors in the Culture. I am your co-host, Joshua Meekins, joined by my amazing co-host, Amir Smith. What's up, guys? And this episode is kicking off a very special capsule season that we are doing, supported by Black Music City. So Black Music City recognizes and honors the influence of Philadelphia's Black music heritage and is a collaboration between Philadelphia Public Music Radio Stations, WXPN, and WRTI, both FM stations, and Rec Philly. As a proud recipient of the 2024 Black Music City grant, we are focusing this special season on true disruptors in the culture. This is for Black Philadelphians whose musical expression and innovations disrupted and moved the music industry forward and changed it forever. So this season, we're going to be with some titans of the industry. Um, we're going to kick it off with a very, very special episode, this one, with none other than who we would consider one half, possibly one third of the architect of Philadelphia's music industry, we're going to speak with Mr. Kenny Gamble himself. So in this interview, we learn a lot about Mr. Gamble, even outside of what you could find online on Wikipedia. Mr. Gamble talked about his incredible legacy as a songwriter, his beginnings in actually trying to get into the industry, and the Midas touch that they have. Over 200 unique songwriting credits and production credits, with 175 of them going gold or platinum. But the over 2,000 credits that they have with an incredible catalog that has been licensed and sampled and breathed new life into lots of music going forward. So without further ado, Mr. Kenny Gamble. So Mr. Gamble, we're so honored to have you on our show, Disruptors in the Culture. Um, we, You're the very first episode for this special season where we're talking with honestly, Black Philadelphians who changed the music industry forever. We feel like when it comes to music and modern music, it begins and ends with Gamble and Huff. Hey. You have Motown and you have the Philadelphia Sounds. When people look at you and they say, Mr. Gamble, you're such a legend, how does that make you feel? Like, how does it feel to be called a legend? How does it feel to be a legend? Well, it's, it makes, makes you sometimes feel a little sentimental. Sentimental, excuse me. And uh, I feel grateful and thankful that uh, we had an opportunity to work together all these years. And um, that makes it all worthwhile that you can work together, feed your family, grow together. And, uh, and once again, I just say that I'm very grateful and really thankful for the opportunity to express myself through music along with us. Me and Huff, we, we, um, we used to talk about, you know, getting a hit record or doing something. And it, the beautiful part of it is, is that it really, really happened. So uh, thank you for even inviting me here and uh, the whole Philly International crew. It was a lot of us that we grew up in Philly, and we still live in Philly. Uh, this is the greatest city in America, Philadelphia. Before you came on, we were um, talking amongst ourselves, and we were looking at your credits mm -hmm. of over 2,000 songwriting credits and, and production credits. But when we looked at, okay, production, it's like over 200 songs. And over 175 of them went gold or platinum. We said, if that's not the Midas touch, we don't know what else is. Like, mm -hmm. have you, to hear that you guys were just like hoping to make a hit record to then having hit after hit after hit after hit, it's incredible. Like when you were a young person, like a, a kid in like middle school, what made you even want to start making music? Well, music was my life. You know, and and I, I I learned from a lot of wonderful people how to 
how to get into the music industry because it's it's an industry. It's it's a it's a job. It's it's all of those things in one. And, and plus, if you you know, uh, we had so many great people that showed us the way of how to get in to the the industry of the music, the entertainment industry. And so it became a way to feed your family. It's a, pla a place where you can actually grow old together and, uh, and try to write songs that'll last forever. And so we realized that the song was the number one uh, contributor to, to longevity. And they don't have to, people don't have to know what you look like, but they can hear you, you know. And it's it's one thing to 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 talk about the song, but when you hear that song and hear it for for year after year after year after year, and then that same song is recorded by other people, mm -hmm. and we had some wonderful singers with us, wonderful. Uh, producers, young producers, uh, the Fadden and Whitehead was with us. So it wasn't just all Gambling House and Tom Bell. We had we had a tribe that we were we were, we were and um, and it really worked. And it worked for us. It can work for anybody if you work together and you treat each other uh, like uh, like humans and and respect them try to build something for the future generations. That's what I, I love about it, is that this will go on for a long time. And we wrote about it in our songs. When you were, both, like you said, it was an industry, you, and some people helped you get into the industry. Who, what was the industry in Philly like before, you know, you, Mr. Huff, and Tom Bell came into it? Or even before, so I'm guessing, yeah. Like in the 50s, like what was the industry even like? Well, the whole music entertainment industry has its history. Uh, and it's no different than being able to sit in a nice part of a theater or you can't even enter some theaters because of your race or your creed. or It's been going through the same old... Uh, uh, ridiculous, but necessary. And I said that ridiculous, but necessary, because we, the uh, especially the African American uh, people in, around the world, have gone through an experience experience that no one has gone through. And when you start to look at uh, here in America, that that there was hardly any relationship between African-Americans and other uh, groups of people. And so we created our own, our own way of life. We're still doing that as a people. And I think that it's working out better for us that we have our own dance steps. We got our own everything. And everybody wants to be like us instead of us trying to be like them. And um, so we, we're, we've been through those years also, too, where we wanted to be somebody else. We wanted to look like them. You know, we wanted to, wanted to walk like them, talk like them. But it was better when we were able to put together some dances. Even if they got dances today that people wish they could do, but they can't do them because they didn't, they didn't, they didn't get them for them. You got to look at our community. We got our own culture. We own everything, and we we got to respect it and hold on to it. So definitely, so, with even even that in mind too, you talk about how it was at the time difficult a little bit for you to you know make the music that you were trying to create. What do you felt like kept you going, and what really inspired you during those times to create? Um, to create the sound that you created and the music as well? Well, what keep, keeps me going is people that I respect, the people that I love. Mm -hmm. And um, and 
That includes so many wonderful people, but one of them in particular is someone like the James Brown. You got to look at James Brown and he said, wow, what motivates this man? He can dance. I mean, we can sing. He can sing the... He can sing the blues. He can sing. He can sing an opera. So, um, speaking of your inspiration, Mr. Gamble, what what do you think was the biggest inspiration behind your production style? Because I I remember everyone said what made the the sound of Philadelphia really stand out were a lot of the lush string arrangements and just the way you guys produced. Like what. What made you like say, okay, I'm going to add this element and make this a sound like nothing else? Well, you know, that was the Philly sound back then. And, you know, you had DJs here in Philly who were very instrumental. And what we all heard on the radio, people like Georgie Woods and and um, all, all of the wonderful DJs like Jerry Blavitt and and uh, Jimmy Bishop, and it, it, it just was a different, you had an American bandstand in Philadelphia. So if you got American bandstand in a city like Philadelphia, that I think that uh, when you have American bandstand, you have so many wonderful, uh, wonderful groups of people you have Italian community, you have German community. We've got all a, a great mixture of people that live here in Philadelphia. And so Frankie Avalon, Fabian, all of these different artists, that's the sound of Philadelphia is when you include everyone. And then we look at our community as being a part of a global community where we've all been able to work with each other and compete with each other. And it's all good. It's like Chubby Checker. Chubby Checker, I was talking about him earlier. He's a wonderful dude. And uh, he he's the only person that I know has had a number one record twice uh, and one with one artist off Chubby Checker. He, Chubby Checker had the twist was number one twice. Chubby Checker created that, uh, but he also uh, covered a record by Hank Ballard, who was who was the um, one of the artists that recorded the Twist also, but it, it never got played on some of the Caucasian or white stations. But it was on around the world. Chubby Checker was a, a, a number one record all over the world. And I think that that's what makes the sound of Philadelphia so great. You got so many kinds of people. And um, and it's getting better. It's getting better every day because the strings, the horns, the band, the MFSB orchestra that we have, it's uh it's not it's it's, it's not something usual, it's the unusual about uh, MFSB and you got so many wonderful background singers, the oil lines. You got people that have come from out of space. Well, out of space. <laughs> I, don't, I don't mean in, in, in that kind of that way, but th these are people who come from out of town, I meant to say, not out of space. Although sometimes they do act like we are we're from out of space, but we are. Uh, we seem to be able to come back down to earth when we get a chance. So I'm, I'm proud of what we're doing. And, uh, and Leon Huff and Tom Bell and Bobby Martin. I mean, I'm just, it's just a whole group of, of people who, um, who really is, um, really is into the music and into the promotion and the marketing and all of those types of things. So that's the best way for it. We have a good family of, of, of uh, music people. Absolutely. Um, so, I mean, me and Joshua, we're both wearing some of the 
Gamble and Huff merch, hey. honoring your legacy. Looks good. And we, you know, over all these decades, I know you have also become one of the most, I mean, you're one of the most successful real estate developers in Philadelphia. Mm-hmm. And then you also have the universal schools. Right. Like you had a career even outside of music that has just really helped define Philadelphia itself. How do you balance it all? Like, I know the catalog is always busy and you guys with licensing the music to newer artists and people sampling. Then on top of that, all of the real estate and then the schools at this stage in your life, what, how do you balance it? I don't try to, I just let it flow. I know that's right. Yeah. Just let it flow. And and it kind of like will take care of itself. You know, it's like, uh, like when you read up on a, on a guy named John Africa, I don't know if you've ever heard of John Africa. Absolutely. But I have a lot of respect for John Africa, you know, because he was basically, and people still don't know that much about him, but as time goes by, when you think about, well, what about John Africa? I think he was wonderful. He was something that people need and even need now because he uh, used to talk about and how the earth is the mother of all everything on on this planet, and I think that um, that he was he was ahead of the of many of these people who were who were afraid of the earth, and so I I, I think of John Africa and and all of the the things that have happened in this city to show that. There's nothing to be afraid of. There's nothing to be afraid of. You join in. You join in on something when it's as great as uh, as the move people, you know. And I, I saw them uh, as as a as an asset to to our society. And um, I tried my best to, to think of what they were trying to do as as something to help that was good for for us. I mean, it's like McFadden and Whitehead said, no stopping us now, we're on the move. And that used to be the move, people, when you walk by them. And they say, we're on the move. And I, that's what I say about uh, about this whole thing with Philly and the National and McFadden and Whitehead. We're on the move. That's what it mm-hmm. is. Mm-hmm. Making Philadelphia better. Mm-hmm. So for yeah. people who might be listening, who don't know who John Africa was. Um, John Africa was the founder of the MOVE movement. Um, people internationally know of the MOVE movement because the city of Philadelphia, the um, the mayor and the government at the time bombed Osage Avenue. Um, MOVE was basically a back to Africa resistance movement that was talking about black liberation Right. And also political rights of residents, especially in the Philadelphia area, and trying to educate people on the right to self, you know, self-preservation and self-determination and building your own life here in Philadelphia and making people politically engaged. So when Mr. Gamble was talking about, I feel like Philly International and all the infrastructure you've built in the city definitely directly mirrors the right to self-preservation from the schools and the education to just even, I feel like in addition to certain people in the industry, like Prince God, you know, rest in peace. You guys were so instrumental in teaching young artists about ownership, having your masters, Mm -hmm. um, keeping a trail of your licenses and things like that. And how to, yeah, how to be a business person in the music industry. Um, so I guess our next question is kind of like when we talk about the sound of Philadelphia, you said there's so much more coming. What do you see as the future of the sound of Philadelphia? Like, are there any artists that you see now that are doing music that you feel like are there the future or? Well, I see, I see a couple of artists, uh, but every day there's, there's some, somebody somewhere that has a new idea. And if you can get that idea published or get it uh, recorded or whatever, then it's up to you because you, 
you have to be aggressive. You know, I can remember when uh, we started out, we were out every day trying to sell people on our on our sound. You know, hey, listen to this for me. Can can you help me get a, a record deal? Can you help me do? Because nobody's going to come to you or me or anybody else and just give you something without you putting some effort into it yourself. And lots of times people say, nah, I don't want nothing today. I say, no problem, I'll be back tomorrow. And you keep going back, and you keep going back. And they should, I should drive them crazy, say, here's that guy again, you know. But I was serious about it, and I thought, I thought it was good, you know. So if I thought it was good, then why not me be the first person to uh, to promote it as much as I can? So uh, so I think it's wonderful. And, and and the point you made on John Africa, it's like Ramona, Africa, it's got um, it's it's all all those these are these are wonderful people. And uh, and I just wanted to to uh, bring them out on the show today and. And because I, I didn't write anything down, but the thing of it is, is that they came into my heart uh, to talk about the the, the beauty of of, of uh, sometimes, and maybe one day they they'll get someone to to uh, to apologize to them, although something fatal happened, whatever. Mm-hmm. But there, there's a lot of love in John Africa and the Move family. And uh, cause what made me think of it a little bit is this album that's sitting over here, uh, Family Reunion. <laughs> mm. Yeah, that's a good one. The Family Reunion, it's time for the whole human family to, uh, to work together. Absolutely. When when you say you used to go around every day, were you asking and, and asked them to like play your music or was it radio stations? Who were you going to to try to convince to like get you, you know, get your music out there? Well, mainly radio stations that I used to go to every day. Um, and it was beautiful, man. Radio stations, you go to, to uh, disc jockeys. I mean, it used to be a time where the disc jockey was, was king. I mean, you know, today it's a little bit different because of electronics and stuff and digital and all this. You know, I barely can understand uh, a lot of the new technology, which is okay. It's good because it, take a, it, it took a long time for, for us to get used to 45, 78s. I mean, it, yeah, it had all this stuff going on and still going on right now that things are changing. And so I think that people who are in the industry, they got to stay up to date on on the industry and how the industry is working so that you can work work and be able to pay your bills. You got to pay mm-hmm. your bills. And that's exactly what we did. One other point I would like to say is that we did not just have somebody lay something in our lap to hear, you know, no, we had to work. We had jobs. We worked after we uh, went to work after uh, we was in the session, or we and we we took care, and we didn't make a lot of money. Nobody makes a lot of money in the beginning, but the thing of it is, is you want to be able to take care of yourself, and you learn as you go along, so that you can learn about the industry. You learn about what does, what all of these things, what do they mean publishing? What do they mean? And that's what we're doing with uh, Philly International and uh, with my son, Khalif. They're working together all on putting seminars together, doing things so, they can, so you, can, you can bring people together and talk about, well, what is a publishing company? What does a publishing company do? What is your responsibility? Sure, you want to be a publishing company, but can you be a publishing company? Are you going to get some money so that you can protect people's copyrights and protect your own copyrights? Or are you sitting around and talking about something that you think is going to happen 
none of it is going to happen unless you yourself, unless they get out and you yourself get out there and protect your your uh, your works. Yeah, well, it'll, it'll be um, be a wonderful thing because these uh, these songs they last forever, mm -hmm. and so you write about your heart, you write about write about the times that your heart's been broken. That's that's enough to to fill the day right there. Write about <laughs> write about how many times you, you you your heart has made you feel good. Talk to, to people. Talk to yourself, you know. And and that's how uh, Huff and I we used to write songs about about the world, the way the world. Is. That's why I mentioned John Africa, because what about John Africa? What you know? I keep mentioning his name because this is made. What when was that? Made of what? Yeah. I can't I can't think of it now. But May thirteenth. May thirteenth. May the thirteenth. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. So just remember, it, it, it's always somebody in, who was that that, that said that May 13th? Amira. Hey, Amira, how you doing, okay. bro? <laughs> yeah, it's good. Because the story is already told. And, uh, you know, I, I just pray and hope that uh, that you, you brothers and sisters out there, you... You know, you just think about it. Yeah, it's another song that made me think about it. I'm pulling out out of my brain now. Song, it's a song that we have that I love to do. It's called "Don't Go to Jail." It says, "Here's a song for the brothers and sisters in jail," and uh, we got a nice melody to it. But it's the truth, though. These songs. They can wake up a whole community. You sit, you read, get a song like that. Say, "Wow, yeah, what about the brothers that's in jail? Yeah, how many of them is in jail? How many African Americans are in prison today for no reason that people are not even thinking about them because they can, they don't have no way to think about them. They got all this equipment. You see, <clears throat> write about the things that people can't write about, and." Uh, and a song. Let the song be the That's why we said the message is in the music. Yeah. You see? So you got to read it. Hey, I was telling them, um, this is what made me, I don't know why I picked this here up today. No, I, this is the family reunion album, and it had so much of uh, what I was I was thinking about today mm -hmm. because this, this album was very close to me when we were doing it because the OJs, I love the OJs and uh, Family Reunion album. This is one of those albums that we put out with the, uh, and we started doing uh, with National Women's, some, uh, what was their last name? I can't remember their last name, but the thing of Dorothy Height was her name. That was her oh, the National Organization of Women or something. And we went on these tours all over the country with um, with Dorothy Height to uh, put on these uh, picnics all the way over. And it was beautiful. I mean, it was wonderful. And uh, we had so many young people. We had... And uh, so many young people who came out to learn more about their health and, and how to take care of their bodies. Because I believe that people don't realize that your body is a machine. It's, it's a human machine. And if you don't take care of it, it's going to break down on you. So each year, we learn, we learn more and more and more and more about this wonderful machine that we have, these bones and these, the, all the veins. And I mean, who put this together is the question. So that's what I spent my time doing, trying to figure it out. I said, who would, who could, 
who can do this, first of all. Yeah. <laughs> How in the world is somebody going to make a foot? You got to be kidding. You talk yeah. about there's a power, you see, mm -hmm. and you got to connect with that power. You connect with that power, and you you already done, you already done did a lot, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah, let me tell you, um, just like you said, who put this together? I feel like a lot of young musicians and people. We look at you, Mr. Huff, Mr. Tom Bell. God bless his soul. We we look at your career and we say who. Who would have put so much together? Even hearing you talk about the family reunion album and the picnics you guys did, that was a whole social impact campaign That's true. around yeah. music. And oh, I'm sorry, I didn't want to cut you off, but you guys had such socially conscious music and outside of just singing and writing the songs and having the music out there, you guys put movements behind the music to help improve the lives of people. Um, wow, I think you guys set a standard and a precedent with that for others to follow the blueprint. Well, we were listening to some music before we started the interview, and and we did. We did a lot of that, but we learned that from... Well, you, when you look at the whole music community, say, for example, you got Marvin Gaye. Mm -hmm. Marvin Gaye was talking about what's going on. And, and you know, you got to look at a, a song like that. That song is, that song going to live forever. And it's going to wake somebody up when, when, it, when, it, when it comes around. And it, it could save somebody's life, you know. What's going on? You know, what's happening, brother? All of this is our language and, and our... So we, we have a great opportunity to use our music. And that's why when uh, I think of the music, I think of it as being, it's the message, it's the drums on, uh, with the music that can go inside, inside the places that nobody can get into them drums. So I, I think that uh, it's the music. It's the message is in the music. The message is in the songs. Mm -hmm. and Especially, you've, oh, I'm sorry. No, go ahead, brother. You were, you've been talking so much about infusing your music with what, what's going on in the world, you know, you know making people feel something, uh, 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 kind of taking what they've observed. When you were making these songs, did you have the intention of, I want this song to make them feel this way, or I want this song to make them feel this way or think about something. Like, did you, when you went to create music, did you have an intention behind that? Nope, just write what you feel. That's all. Just trying to write what you feel and uh, and feel what you write, you know, because if, uh, if you write about it, might be something you see, you saw, might be something that somebody told you, just like a, you know, because you think different every day. Every day is, is different, you know. Yeah. So um main thing is, uh, you know, just try to tell the truth. Mm. And if you do that, that's, that's going to cut out a lot of stuff right there if you, if you just tell the truth. You know, and stop lying. If you stop lying... And then I think the whole world will be better. Mm -hmm. I think, um, I, okay, so I guess this is a, a question we, we usually ask everyone. As we say, like being a disruptor, we define it, I guess being a disruptor is someone who does something that's tr doing a task or an art form, anything, when it's done in a traditional way, and then they come and do it in a totally different way than what was done before. And so, as we said, as we started, we consider you a disruptor. How, how does it, like, what does it mean to you to be a disruptor? To be in the front? No, to be a disruptor. Oh, a Someone disruptor. who did something completely, that was done before, but in a completely different way. Oh, I don't know. I think you got to be inspired, you know. Mm. Yeah. You know, you, you got to be inspired. And once you're inspired, nothing nothing can stop you then. 
You know, your inspiration is, is what's motivating you. And you see something that maybe the whole world don't see it, but that's not going to stop you. Mm -hmm. You know? So that's what I think. I think that inspiration is everything. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think we got we have two more questions to ask you, and I think these are like these are a little bit more fun to kind of get an understanding of like who okay. uh, who where you are now, and how you feel. I think one of the the good ones we have that I know Amir wrote down is um, if they made a feature film, if they made a film about your life, who would you want to play you? Oh boy, I don't know. <laughs> that's <laughs> now that's a good question because I don't know. You know. I don't know what I could, who, who could do that? It was somebody that have to come up that want to do it. You know, somebody. All right, and then another question we have for you is for this, this like this time in your life, let me find it. Um, is there a, is there an album or even a song that kind of defines where you are at this time in your life? Right now, mm. no, but I think we could probably put one together, you know, to uh, that would tell a story a little bit because each each album that we did had had all kinds of songs in them, you know, like like say for example Jerry Butler. I don't know how I many you know Jerry Butler, but Jerry Butler had an album called Only the Strong Survive. That's what I think is right right now. Only the strong survive. The, the strong people win. You know, a lot of people complain that man, it's too hard, man. It's just hey, listen. Only the strong survives. And the beautiful thing about that song, we were talking earlier when I said that a lot of our songs have been they've been recorded by all kinds of people. Elvis Presley, I know you've heard of Elvis Presley before, I know. Yes. He recorded Only the Strong Survive. That was a Gamble Huff song. And it, ma it makes it a big difference that that song, when your songs cross over to, to what they call pop music, it makes a big difference in your royalty checks. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you, you might get a few pennies from uh, from some of the rhythm and blues people but when you do a pop you get a pop hit you get you get a, you get a quite a few little uh, little trinkets you get a little money coming along with that but that's why everybody said man you got to cross over you got to cross over yeah because it's another level that you go in order from the economic side but uh, that's good. Yeah, I think can we can we sneak in with your question that you had before, Josh? Oh yeah, more? about the the song. Yeah. If you had so you your discography is amazing. We were going over it before we we talked earlier today, um, and I wanted to know if you had to pick a favorite song that you made, what song would it be? Uh, that we've done. Yeah, that you've made. And we've made, well, I think, um, I think the intruders, cowboys and girls. Really? Mm. I love that'll be it. Your, that'll be your hands down favorite? Yeah, I think Lil Sonny from the intruders. Mm. Yeah. Because he's unique. He's different. And plus, we used to have so much fun together, you know, mm -hmm. because none of we had we had nothing. Nobody had nothing. So you you there, you know, when when the plate was empty, you know, we were all wishing and hoping and praying every time you turn around that we get a hit. And then you get lucky one day and you hit a song called "Cowboys to Girls." And it becomes number one all over the world. So 
That's my favorite. That's my favorite group, by the way. Yeah. And that's got a good story behind it, too. The tr- uh, I said that's got a good story behind it, too. Cowboys and Girls? Yeah. Oh, yeah, it's wonderful. All them guys, it's great. You know, we all we all were so happy. We didn't know anything about the business, you know. So that's how you learn. You learn from your mistakes, mistakes sometimes. Because uh, one of our partners back then was, I don't know if you guys remember him, but he was a, his name was, a, his name was a Benny Crass, Crass Brothers Clover. That was our partner. He didn't know the record business either. He knew the clothing business, but he didn't really know the he didn't know that um, that building. So all, all all in learning and working with people that because you ain't gonna get everything you want right when you want to. You got to bring something to the table. Mm-hmm. You know. Well, I think that's all of our questions that we have. And we, we're like extremely, extremely honored to have this time with you. And to speak. Man, we thank you so much for coming to join us on Disruptors in the Culture. Um, is This is huge. Yeah. Like, this is so huge. You're an icon and a legend. And honestly, you, it, what you and Mr. Huff did, you guys built the industry here in Philadelphia as far as for music. Um, you really made the world take notice to Philadelphia musically outside of it just being, you know, some songs, some bands, some groups. That's you right. made the whole world stand up and take notice. So we just really wanted to have you on as to kick off this season to really honor you and to to get some, you know, you gave us some great tips and some gems in this. So we yeah. really thank you. Well, I enjoy it, me personally. I enjoy talking to people. And sometimes, you know, I I like to talk so so everybody can, might be one person in that group that wants to reach out and touch somebody's hand. You don't know. You don't know who the person Mm -hmm. is going to be because uh, you can't be afraid. You got to be out there because this, this thing here is, all over the world. We go all over the world and you got people, we'll never know them. We'll never know them. They come up to us, they say, man, I was listening to your music. And uh, they know more about that music than I do. A lot of these people, when we go to England and London and all these places, because they want to know, well, how did you think of that? I mean, what, what, what made you think about uh, that stuff, you know. So I'm saying your guess is good as mine. I don't know how it happened, but I do know one thing. I know that it happened, mm-hmm. and uh, and that is important. And we we'll, and we're gonna keep it going as long as I'm living. I got my my man over there, Mr. Cleef. He working. So my daughter in there. Yeah, she in there, Princess Idea. Got Joy. We got a nice little crew here this day. Mm-hmm. Nice little tribe. <laughs> right, Creep? It's beautiful. You know? Yeah, it's a, it's a wonderful thing. Well, thank you again, Mr. Gamble. Well, forever grateful for this. Thank you so much. And your impact is, again, it's immeasurable in the city of Philadelphia and in music. So, again, thank you. All right. Let's, All right. Just let me know when you're going to do it again. Absolutely. Sounds good. <laughs> Sounds good. Sounds good.